The history of Las Vegas is much different than that of other famous American cities. Most of its short 100-year existence has been demolished or replaced. Las Vegas' history has been documented in pencil. It's written, erased, and written over again in the same place. It can make learning difficult because we aren't able to physically visit most of these locations. However, with some imagination, we can retell the history of this oasis in the desert. We'll begin by learning about the Paiute Native Americans and their time in Las Vegas. Then, we'll find out how Senator William A. Clark put Vegas on the map by building a railroad station in town. We'll get to know a man named J.T. McWilliams and how he had hoped his ragtown would bring him riches. Electricity became available when the nearby Boulder Dam was completed, and it would make Las Vegas one of the brightest cities on Earth. Resorts would spring up on Fremont Street and the Strip, and we'll learn about the historic casinos that had an impact on the city. We'll cover some of the Vegas visionaries like Steve Wynn and Howard Hughes, and how they impacted the city with their ideas. Finally, we'll learn about how Las Vegas has become a thrill attraction destination, and how sports teams are now calling Las Vegas home. Let's learn about the history of Las Vegas. Native Americans were the first peoples to live in the Las Vegas region, and their descendants have inhabited the Las Vegas Valley for over 10,000 years. The Tudino and Paiute tribes have called Vegas their home for over 1,000 years. They called themselves the Desert People, and they occupied the territory that includes the Colorado River, southeastern Nevada, and parts of California and Utah. They were the ancestors of the modern-day Paiute tribe, which would migrate between the mountains in the summer and the Las Vegas Valley during the wintertime. Archaeologists have found pictographs and other historical items that have helped us learn more about the original Las Vegas residents. During the 19th century, settlers moved into the Las Vegas region and displaced most of the Native Americans. The natives lost their lands, homes, and culture. However, they would one day receive assistance from a rancher named Helen Stewart, who had empathy for them for being forced to leave their homes. Helen Stewart owned a large piece of land near what would one day become downtown Las Vegas, and she would go on to donate 10 acres of that land to the local Paiute tribe. The Native Americans would use the land to establish the Las Vegas Paiute Colony, which is dedicated to preserving Native culture. The first major migration to the Las Vegas region took place in 1855, when William Bringhurst led a group of Mormon missionaries from Utah to the Las Vegas Valley. The group was part of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The missionaries built a fort in the Las Vegas Springs area, with the purpose of converting the Paiutes and developing a town on the trade route from Salt Lake City to Los Angeles. They constructed a large adobe fort near a creek and used flood irrigation to water their crops. However, the Mormons' plans failed because of tensions among leaders of the community, difficulties in converting the local Paiute natives, and the summer heat made growing crops almost impossible. Eventually, the missionaries abandoned the fort in 1857 and returned back to Utah. Thankfully, the remains of the fort have been preserved for visitors to view at the old Las Vegas Mormon Fort State Historic Park. The area would remain unsettled for a few years until a man named Octavius Gass obtained the fort and its land with help from the United States government. The Paiute tribe gave up ownership of the area around the fort to the United States in return for supplies of food and farming equipment. Gas began making wine after renaming the area Las Vegas Rancho, and Las Vegas became known as the best stop on the old Spanish trail. Sadly, Gas accumulated large debts and had to sell the property. He would be another person to receive help from Helen Stewart as she purchased his property in order to help pay his debts. William Andrews Clark was a self-interested businessman and politician that would help found the city of Las Vegas. 
He was born 1839 and excelled at his school studies. So much so that he became a teacher in his home state of Iowa at the young age of 17. However, William preferred to use his intelligence to benefit himself instead of others. Clark was labeled as greedy because he was always looking for ways to make money. Clark was a soldier in the United States Civil War, and instead of fighting alongside his fellow soldiers, he decided to desert his post to open a mining business. He would later open the Company Store, which was based in Salt Lake City, Utah. The Company Store specialized in shipping goods and supplies to miners that were located in very rural places. Clark took advantage of the miners who had little options due to being so far from the cities, and he charged them higher prices than others were charged. Clark felt that he could make more money by becoming a politician, and he had began a political campaign for senator. He began giving bribes to other politicians, hoping that they would help him secure a position. But it failed as Washington, D.C. caught wind of his plans and kept him out of the race that year for trying to cheat. Clark ran again in 1901 for political office, but this time he appealed to the local mining population to help him get elected instead of trying to bribe politicians. Clark made false promises to the miners on things that he could never deliver, such as shorter workdays and higher wages. He was elected and did not make good on any of his campaign promises to those who had elected him. The Las Vegas Valley was unknown to Clark until his brother-in-law suggested that William research the area as a potential site for a railroad station. Clark had been wanting to run a railroad line from Salt Lake City in Utah to the shipping ports of Los Angeles in California. A railroad would be a much faster form of transportation for his goods, and most importantly for Clark, make more money and profits. He would also be able to develop a town site around the railroad station that could work to support his businesses. Any trains that would run from Salt Lake City to Los Angeles would need a location about halfway through for the trains to stop and be serviced. Las Vegas was the perfect location for this halfway stop because it was the location of a natural water spring that would be perfect for replenishing the steam engines making the journey to California. Senator Clark agreed that Las Vegas would be a great location, and he reached out to a well-known Las Vegas landowner named Helen Stewart. Helen Stewart agreed to sell him 1,800 acres of her ranch land in Las Vegas so that Clark could build his railroad station in town site. Helen Stewart hired a professional land surveyor by the name of J.T. McWilliams to help her map out the 1,800 acres of ranch land that was being sold to William Clark. While surveying the ranch, McWilliams noticed that there was a tract of government land for sale next to where Senator Clark was planning to build his railroad. J.T. saw an opportunity to make money quickly by developing a town site before Clark arrived to build his railroad. In 1904, McWilliams filed a claim and purchased the government land, and he hoped the land's value would skyrocket once Clark's railroad arrived. J.T. subdivided his land into lots, and he named the area the original town site of Las Vegas. J.T. McWilliams took out advertisements in Los Angeles newspapers for his proposed town site and listed his subdivided lots for sale for an average of $200. Sales were better than expected, and JT quickly sold his lots to various groups such as investors, miners, and even outlaws. McWilliams made promises to the buyers of one day constructing paved roads and giving them access to limitless natural spring water. However, like almost all other goods in the Vegas region during 1904, building materials were scarce. The buildings in the McWilliams town site were built hastily with pieces of timber and tent canvases, which would result in the town receiving its Ragtown nickname. The first few months in the Ragtown town site saw a flourish of businesses and social activity. However, it was short-lived as the Ragtown residents were constantly fighting the Las Vegas weather that was extremely hot and windy. McWilliams worked hard to sell his new residents on the idea that
Vegas town site. The United States government engineers at the Bureau of Reclamation were looking for a place to build a hydroelectric dam that could help power the Nevada region. Engineers felt that the Southern Nevada's Black Canyon and the nearby Boulder Canyon had serious potential to support a dam and could potentially produce hydroelectric power and water for irrigation. The area was also reachable by road as it was located off Highway 93 that ran between Las Vegas and Arizona. The construction of the Boulder Dam was approved in 1928 and it would one day transform Vegas from a dusty railroad town into an electric neon fantasy. The construction project attracted thousands of ambitious young men from all over the United States, as the project was happening during the Great Depression when finding work was difficult. Would-be workers accepted positions, even if the job meant working in some of the harshest working conditions, as temperatures would reach over 100 degrees on the average day. The Las Vegas town site at this time had a small population of less than 5,000, but the city would soon see an influx of thousands of workers descend upon the city. The Boulder Dam was completed at an impressive two years ahead of schedule, and by 1939, the dam had become the most powerful hydroelectric dam in the world. The dam would later be renamed to the Hoover Dam in 1947, in honor of U.S. President Hoover, who was a supporter of the project. And without him, construction would not have been possible. Fremont Street was the original main street in the history of Las Vegas, and it's still attracting thousands of visitors every day. It's located in downtown Las Vegas, and it's the second most famous street in the region besides the Las Vegas Strip. Fremont Street was named in honor of explorer and politician John C. Fremont, and it is, or was, the address for many famous casinos, such as Binion's Horseshoe, the El Dorado Club, Golden Nugget, and the Pioneer Club. The lots on Fremont Street sold quickly during the auction that had been held by Senator Clark, and the area would experience heavy city traffic. It was for such reasons that Fremont Street became the first paved street in Las Vegas in 1925, and the first to receive a streetlight in 1931. The mid-1990s saw renovations to Fremont Street, and vehicle traffic was officially closed off. In 1996, a six-block stretch of Fremont Street was converted into a pedestrian mall called the Fremont Experience. In 2004, Fremont Street installed a vaulted canopy that would cover four blocks of the street with 49 million LED lights. The canopy that covers the Fremont Street experience is the largest video screen in the world, and it runs hourly shows that pay tribute to Nevada's most famous character traits. In fact, the LED lights from Fremont Street are so bright that the canopy can operate video shows even in the daylight. The first resort to be constructed on the Las Vegas Strip was called the El Rancho. It opened on April 3, 1941, and it began what would become a long history of hotels that have operated on the Strip. The El Rancho was the idea of a man named Thomas Hull, who was a hotelier that operated resorts in California and was looking to expand his operations to Las Vegas. The resort was located on the corner of San Francisco Avenue and Highway 91, which would later become known as Sahara Avenue and the Las Vegas Strip, respectively. Hull intended to target motorists traveling from Los Angeles to Las Vegas by offering travelers a hotel and casino in one place. The El Rancho Resort experienced early success, which would inspire others to open resorts on Highway 91. Food lovers can thank El Rancho because it was this resort that added an all-you-can-eat buffet in the 1940s, popularizing the concept in Las Vegas. Unfortunately, on June 17, 1960, a fire destroyed the El Rancho, and the resort permanently closed as a result of the incident. Like many future Vegas properties, the El Rancho was demolished, and the property today is the location of the festival grounds owned by MGM. The success of the El Rancho Resort caught the attention of theater magnate R.E. Griffin, and he felt that Las Vegas had room for another resort. Locals thought the idea of having two casino resorts in town was ridiculous, and they thought Griffith was crazy. 
He had his sights set on the Paradise nightclub that had been operating on Highway 91, and it was the first nightclub on what would later become the Las Vegas Strip. Griffith and his nephew purchased the nightclub property for $1,000 an acre and began building the second hotel resort in Las Vegas, which they named The Last Frontier. Construction on The Last Frontier was difficult because in 1942, the United States was fighting in World War II and supplies for the war had priority. In order to complete The Last Frontier's construction, the engineering team had to resort to finding recycled materials and using some of the old nightclub's buildings. Griffith bought an abandoned mine in the Las Vegas mountains so that his team could reuse the wiring and other electrical materials. Food was being rationed during wartime, so Griffith's team bought local ranches and raised cattle for food and milk to be served at Last Frontier. Finally, the crew was able to buy used items from existing downtown casinos, with the best find being an antique 40-foot mahogany bar with French beveled glass from the Arizona Club on Fremont Street. The Last Frontier opened on October 30, 1942, as a country western themed resort, and the layout of the property was designed to resemble a main street from an old Wild West town. The resort included lots of plants to add to the western theme, and it was landscaped with 3,700 trees, plants, and shrubs. The Last Frontier had 105 rooms for guests to stay, and it also included the Little Church of the West, which would help begin the spontaneous Vegas wedding trend. The Carrillo Room, which was named after the Cisco Kid's sidekick, Leo Carrillo, was originally the main building of the old 91 Club. The resort was also the first in Las Vegas to host world-famous entertainers in hopes of attracting more guests. Last Frontier would host some of the biggest names in entertainment, like Ronald Reagan, Carol Burnett, and John Wayne. Unfortunately, R. E. Griffith passed away in 1943, and his partner did his best to operate the resort after Griffith's passing. The Last Frontier was sold in 1951, and it would stay around Las Vegas under various ownerships until it was demolished in 2007. Las Vegas would have access to large amounts of electricity after the completion of the Boulder Dam, and it would help the city become filled with neon lights. It was the dam's hydroelectric power that would help transform Las Vegas from a sleepy frontier town into the tourist attraction it is today. Las Vegas had been looking for a way to attract motorists, and neon signs seemed to be the perfect solution. Fremont Street was quick to catch neon fever, and it wasn't long before glowing signs began lighting up other businesses. Neon was everywhere as Vegas casinos, diners, and department stores all added neon signs. The 15,000 miles of neon tubing would illuminate the whole city, and all the lights made Las Vegas the brightest city on Earth. What set Las Vegas apart from the rest of America at the time was the sheer number of neon signs, and it would help give downtown Las Vegas the nickname of Glitter Gulch. The neon signs of Las Vegas were elaborate and had personalities of their own. The lights weren't just signs, but rather essential parts of some of Las Vegas's most famous resorts. Competition would drive businesses to create more elaborate buildings and cover them with creative neon signs. Some of Las Vegas's most historic neon signs include the Stardust sign, Binion's Horseshoe, the Golden Nugget, and the Caesars Palace sign. The neon works of art served as great advertising tools, but they also had an added benefit of lighting up the streets of Las Vegas so gamblers would stay long into the morning hours. Two of the most famous neon signs in the history of Las Vegas are the Welcome to Fabulous Las Vegas sign and the Las Vegas Vic sign. Las Vegas Vic is a 90-foot tall cowboy that points in the direction of the Pioneer Club with his moving arm and loud voice calling out with a friendly, Howdy, partner. The neon cowboy has stood on Fremont Street since he was installed in 1951. The Welcome to Fabulous Las Vegas neon sign has been a landmark for those entering Vegas for decades. The sign is located at 5100 Las Vegas Boulevard, and most locals agree that its location is the official southern end of the Las Vegas Strip. 
The neon display was designed by Betty Willis, who was an employee of Western Neon in 1959. She incorporated white circles around the letters of the word welcome on the sign to portray silver dollars, which was a tribute to Nevada being known as the Silver State. Since its installation, the sign has become a must-visit location for those entering Las Vegas, and it's even been listed as an official Nevada historic location. The Las Vegas neon scene would see its greatest glory in the 1960s, when the city was home to five of the world's tallest electric signs. The city had become a shrine to neon, but by the late 1960s, Las Vegas was looking for new ways to market itself, and plastic signs offered a cheaper alternative. New construction projects avoided adding neon because the tubing was seen as a sign of Vegas's past. A majority of the neon that powered Glitter Gulch would be replaced with more modern aesthetics. However, neon signs would always have a special place in the history of Las Vegas. The Flamingo Resort and Hotel was the third to open on the Las Vegas Strip, and it's been a Las Vegas icon ever since. The Flamingo has remained the oldest resort still in operation, and was originally the vision of a man named Billy Wilkerson. He was the owner of some of the most popular nightclubs in Los Angeles, and he chose the name Flamingo because of his love for exotic birds. Like many others before him, Wilkerson saw the potential in Las Vegas, and he purchased 33 acres of land about a half a mile south from the last frontier resort. Wilkerson wanted the Flamingo to be different from the earlier Western-themed hotels on Fremont Street, and he planned to build a resort that included luxurious rooms, a golf course, a nightclub, and a large casino. However, Billy ran into financial problems and found himself in need of financing from outside investors. Instead of looking to traditional sources for a loan, he asked the Mafia if they would be interested in investing in his resort. The notorious mobster Bugsy Siegel came to Las Vegas in 1945 and was looking to purchase ownership in a resort. He purchased the El Cortez on Fremont Street, but his plans to make money had been stalled because city officials were well aware of his criminal past. However, the new resorts opening on Highway 91 were outside the control of the Las Vegas politicians that had held him back from buying into a Fremont Street casino. Siegel was happy to help Billy Wilkerson with help funding the Flamingo in exchange for majority ownership in the resort. In order to keep their purchase in the resort secret, Bugsy Siegel and his partner Meyer Lansky posed as fake business investors and were able to use their mafia funds to invest in the resort. The Flamingo Resort opened on December 26, 1946, at a total cost of $6 million. It was said to be one of the world's greatest resorts, and it boasted a 105-room luxury hotel. However, despite its beauty, the Flamingo's opening was a failure. Bugsy Siegel had arranged for numerous celebrities to be flown in from Hollywood for the grand opening. But bad weather in L.A. on the night of the opening prevented any guests' airplanes from taking off. To make things worse, the hotel's construction hadn't been completed yet. So even if the guests were able to attend the opening, they would not have somewhere to stay. Many of the locals who enjoyed the Old West-style hotels felt uncomfortable with the Flamingo's opulent style, and they decided to skip the opening. The Flamingo lost more than $300,000 in its first weekend, and it would only stay open for another week before temporarily closing. The resort would reopen a year later in 1947, once construction was... pay the Mafia back because he died shortly after the money dispute on June 20th, 1947. Bugsy Siegel's death is one of the most famous unsolved murder cases in American history.
However, many agree that it was his organized crime associates who planned the attack after being told that they wouldn't be getting their money back. The Mafia investors who had helped Bugsy Siegel fund the casino took over operations of the Flamingo Resort after receiving word that Siegel had died. The Mafia would later try to use Siegel's passing as a promotion of the now notorious Flamingo, and they even buried Bugsy's car underneath the hotel. However, the Flamingo realized that being associated with a known criminal was bad for business, and the new owners began an attempt to rehabilitate the resort's image. The Mafia investors sold the Flamingo in 1960 to another group of Mafia members from Florida who renovated the resort to give it a tropical feel. The Flamingo would become extremely successful because of its world-class entertainment and luxurious accommodations. The resort ushered in the golden era of early Vegas entertainment as opening night featured entertainment by singer Jimmy Durante and Cuban band leader Xavier Cuga. Future headliners would include famous performers such as Judy Garland, Ray Charles, and Wayne Newton. The Flamingo's opulence was unrivaled as it had tropical landscaping, green leather waltz in the casino, and red upholstered furniture. It was also the first casino to employ casino retention tactics such as removing all clocks and windows while also designing the floor plan so that guests would always be passing gaming machines. The Flamingo's combination of mafia history, unrivaled luxury, and elite entertainers make it one of the most unique locations in the history of Las Vegas. The Sands Resort and Casino was one of the most famous locations in Las Vegas during the 1950s and 1960s. It was famous for its gigantic neon sign that welcomed visitors driving on the Strip and its world-class entertainment in its Copa room. The resort would achieve world fame when the classic film Ocean's Eleven was filmed at the hotel. The Sands Hotel was the seventh resort to open on the Strip, and it received its name when one of the owner's socks had filled up with sand when inspecting the land that it was built on. The resort's tagline, A Place in the Sun, was taken from an Elizabeth Taylor film that had been recently released. The resort operated from 1952 until November 26, 1996, when the Sands was demolished and the Venetian Resort was built in its place. The Place in the Sun held one of the most lavish resort openings that the Strip had ever seen. The Sands opened in December 1952, and the widely publicized grand opening was attended by more than 12,000 people in the first few hours. Guests on opening night were amazed by the Sands entrance sign because of its beautiful design and size. The Sands sign was the biggest resort entrance sign to ever be built on the Strip, and it notified motorists of the numerous entertainers that were currently performing. Every guest was also given a pass to the Copa Room to see the world-famous Copa dancers, whose costumes were valued at over $10,000 each. That was more than what headliner Danny Thomas was being paid to perform as the main act on opening night. In total, the Sands lost more than $200,000 on opening night, but it turned out to be a worthwhile investment because everyone was buzzing about the Copa Room and the Sands sign. Some of the most famous names in music would take stage at the Sands Copa Room. Frank Sinatra, Sammy Davis Jr., and Dean Martin of the infamous Rat Pack singing group would receive $25,000 checks each week to perform at the Copa. Some of their performances at the Sands were recorded live and would go on to sell as platinum records. The Copa Room was designed in a Brazilian carnival style and named after the famed Copa Cabana Club in New York City. It also became famous for attracting Hollywood celebrities such as Humphrey Bogart, Kirk Douglas, and Lucille Ball. However, the main reason for the Copa's success was due to its band leader, Antonio Morelli. Morelli would treat every celebrity like a member of his family and welcome them to come perform anytime. In fact, entertainers would often meet up at the band leader's home to unwind after a performance. Many gatherings of celebrities took place at his home, and the state of Nevada would later recognize the Morelli House as a historical landmark. <laughs>
the Tropicana is one of the few original Las Vegas resorts to still be in operation today, and it's known as the Tiffany of the Strip. The $15 million construction cost was more than double that of any other Las Vegas resort. The Tropicana was designed in a Havana Cuban theme, and it was created to be the most elegant resort in Vegas. The design included a 60-foot flower-shaped fountain that sat in the center of an enormous swimming pool. It also included special rooms adorned with dancing fountains and crystal chandeliers, which were fit for their celebrity guests. The Tropicana Resort and Casino is still in operation today, and it is located across from the MGM, Excalibur, and Caesars Palace was the 12th resort to open on the Las Vegas Strip on August 5, 1966. The grand opening was one of the most lavish parties that the city has ever seen, and it cost owner Jay Sarnow over a million dollars. Guests were greeted by tremendous amounts of food, including mountains of caviar, two tons of filet mignon, and over 50,000 glasses of champagne. Many celebrities flew to Las Vegas to attend the opening, such as Gene Kelly, Johnny Carson, and Ava Gabor. Caesars also invited over 500 veterans from the local armed forces base to attend the festivities. The resort was an instant success, and the publicity from the grand opening generated over $40 million in revenue from future hotel room bookings. Caesars would become one of the Strip's most popular resorts and a Las Vegas icon. The 1990s would see newer and flashier resorts open on the Las Vegas Strip, and Caesars Palace needed a way to compete with the newer casinos. The result was the Forum Shops at Caesars, and it was one of the first locations in Las Vegas where high-end shopping was an attraction in itself. At first thought, shopping wasn't considered a natural fit for Las Vegas, and critics felt that it would be an unsuccessful experiment. However, the forum shops were more of an experience than an everyday shopping mall. Caesars would prove the critics wrong, as the forum shops would become the highest grossing shopping center in the United States. The grand opening of the forum shops was a huge success. In fact, it was so popular that many shops ran out of inventory and shopping bags. Guests were greeted by Roman-designed themes, and they had plenty of choices on where to shop, as the forum shops had over 100 luxury retailers. The shops also began what would become a Las Vegas trend, and opened the first celebrity chef restaurant called Wolfgang Puck's Spago. The forum shops were also a destination for celebrities, with an example being the Versace Boutique. It had a humidity-controlled vault for evening gowns, which were unlocked only for their most famous clients. The forum shops helped to change Las Vegas' reputation as being just a gambling town to also now being an elite shopping destination.
Howard Hughes helped open the door for corporations to invest in Las Vegas resorts, and the city of Las Vegas was eager to clean up its reputation of being a mafia-run town. The downfall of the mafia in Las Vegas had begun due to the Nevada Corporate Gaming Act and a little black book. The mafia was not able to raise as much money as corporations could, and it made it difficult for them to buy ownership into resorts as they were constantly being outbid. The Corporate Gaming Act required all owners of a casino to be licensed instead of just one person, and this meant that the Mafia could no longer hide their ownership in Vegas resorts. The Little Black Book was a collaborative effort by the corporate hotel owners to create a list of any Mafia members with known crimes against casinos. The owners also agreed to not do any future business with anyone listed in the Black Book. The Mafia left Las Vegas for good in the early 1970s, and the city entered the Vegas corporate hotel era. The corporations wanted to make money, and they replaced the unique themed hotels with bland, larger versions of their corporate chain hotels. Vegas lost much of its charm that visitors came to enjoy, and it wouldn't be until the late 1980s when a man named Steve Wynn brought some fire back to the Strip. The corporate hotel age of the 1970s came to an end when a man named Steve Wynn built the first ever mega resort on the Strip called the Mirage. Wynn understood that visitors preferred resorts that had a theme, and he chose a tropical South Pacific theme for the resort. The Mirage Hotel contained over 3,000 rooms, and it sat on an expansive 65-acre tropical-themed paradise. The resort would become world famous for its unique features like dolphin encounters, white tiger shows, and a volcano. It was the world's most expensive resort ever built, with a cost of over $630 million, and the Mirage would experience immediate success while welcoming in the next Vegas building boom. The Mirage Volcano and Animal Exhibits have entertained millions of visitors since their opening. The Mirage Volcano was designed by Steve Wynn to be a roadside entertainment attraction, and the volcano has since become a Las Vegas icon. It's an artificial volcano that erupts nightly at the front of the resort, directly on the Las Vegas Strip. Gas pipes and jets provide flames for the volcano, while red lights and foam imitate the lava flow. The Mirage also includes a 2 million gallon dolphin habitat that is home to five bottlenose dolphins. It includes a dolphin research center that hosts educational tours in which visitors can interact with the dolphins. Finally, the Mirage was home to the magicians Siegfried and Roy and their exotic white tigers. The resort built a two and a half acre garden at a cost of over $15 million, which was home to the white tigers when they were not performing. The garden also includes other exotic animals such as Bengal tigers, white lions, a snow leopard, and an Asian elephant. The New York, New York Resort was one of the first hotels in Las Vegas to use a city as their theme when it opened in 1997. The hotel was designed to make visitors feel as if they had been transported to New York City, and it even includes replicas of numerous city landmarks, such as the Statue of Liberty. More than 2,000 hotel rooms were built into various skyscrapers, with its tallest structure being a 500-foot replica of the Empire State Building. It was the tallest building in the state of Nevada for almost a decade until the Wynn Resort was built in 2005. The crown jewel of the New York, New York is its Big Apple roller coaster, which races along the top of the hotel in replica New York City taxicabs. The New York, New York Hotel was the exact type of family-friendly resort that the new Las Vegas was looking for. The resort is still in operation and welcomes millions of visitors each year. However, the 1990s had two resorts that helped shape Vegas' history. Steve Wynn's luxurious Bellagio Resort would become one of Las Vegas' most famous and visited locations. The Bellagio Resort debuted on the Las Vegas Strip in 1998 at a cost of $1.6 billion, and it was the world's most expensive hotel. It was built on the site of the Dunes Hotel, which was demolished to make room for a 3,000-room hotel. The resort includes an eight-acre man-made lake, which features a nightly water show with synchronized music and over 1,000 water jets. Bellagio is also famous for being home to the world's largest glass sculpture, 
Fiori di Como, which hangs in the lobby of the hotel. The glass artwork includes more than 2,000 pieces of colored glass, and it weighs over 40,000 pounds. Few hotels can compete with the luxury and service of Bellagio, as it has won Diamond Service Awards for every year it has been in operation. Numerous polls and surveys have recognized Bellagio as the most popular resort in Las Vegas. Steve Wynn had designed the Bellagio to be one of the most luxurious hotels in the world, and its opening had a ripple effect. The boring corporate resorts hurried to renovate or demolish older hotels and convert them into more luxurious destinations. The Las Vegas monorail has carried more than 90 million visitors up and down the Strip since its opening in 1995. The monorail system was a joint project by a handful of resorts on the Strip to connect passengers with some of the most iconic landmarks in Las Vegas. Many visitors recognized the style of the monorail cars being used on the Las Vegas monorail because they were the same Mark IV trains that were used at Walt Disney World on their monorail. There are a total of 36 electric monorail cars that run 30 feet above the ground behind some of the most famous casinos on the Strip. There are seven total stations along the monorail route, with the furthest being the station at the Sahara Resort. Other stops include the Las Vegas Convention Center, Harris Casino, and the Link, which was originally built in 1959 as the Imperial Palace. One of the most popular stops is at the Flamingo and Caesars Palace Station, where guests can visit the Forum Shops and Historic Flamingo Resort. The monorail has plans in the future to add stations to grow the service line to include more resorts and sporting venues. After years of building legendary Las Vegas resorts, Steve Wynn decided he would build the Diamond Jewel Resort on the Las Vegas Strip. He purchased and demolished the historic Desert Inn Hotel to build his masterpiece resort. He named the project after himself, and the Wynn Resort would become one of the top hotels in the world. Steve Wynn used the experience that he gained building other Vegas resorts to build his own 600-foot-tall, 45-floor, 2,000-room hotel. The building was so tall and hard to clean that it installed the first automated window washing system at a Vegas resort. The Wynn Resort also included Las Vegas' largest casino and a convention center to host large events. A few years later, a second tower named Encore was built. It included an additional 2,000 rooms, and it would make the Wynn Encore Resort the seventh largest hotel in the world. Steve Wynn, like many others before him, wanted the Wynn Resort to have unmatched luxury and service for its guests. The Wynn Resort was successful in creating a beautiful environment for guests as it's become one of the most highly awarded resorts on Earth. Roadside attractions have historically played a large role in attracting guests to Las Vegas businesses. The original roadside attractions in Las Vegas were its neon signs, like Vegas Vic, which were made to attract motorists. Steve Wynn would take street side attractions to a new level in the 1980s when he designed the Mirage's volcano attraction that erupted nightly in front of guests on the Las Vegas Strip. Steve Wynn would design another roadside attraction a few years later, right next door to the Mirage at the Treasure Island pirate-themed resort. Treasure Island featured a large pirate battle complete with pirate ships and firing cannons. The attraction is only feet from the Strip, and millions of visitors stop to watch these nightly naval battles. The Bellagio Fountains are one of the more recent attractions in Las Vegas' history, and they are already one of the most famous attractions. The lake in front of the Bellagio Resort comes to life as it's filled with water fountains dancing to music. Thousands of water jets propel colorful water streams hundreds of feet into the air to create beautiful performances. The water shows are often so mesmerizing that they have been known to make the traffic on Las Vegas Boulevard stop. Amusement attractions now play a large part in entertaining visitors that come to Las Vegas. The High Roller is the tallest observation wheel on the planet, and it lifts guests 500 feet above the Las Vegas Strip for one-of-a-kind views of the Las Vegas Valley. Another unique Vegas observation deck is at the replica Eiffel Tower located on the Strip in front of the Paris Resort. It stands right on top of Las Vegas Boulevard, and thousands of guests have visited the attraction since its opening. 
The 1,000-foot-tall Stratosphere Tower Resort is the location of some of Las Vegas' most extreme attractions. The Big Shot attraction sits at the very top of the resort's tower, and it jettisons guests up a 150-foot mast at a speed of over 40 miles per hour. The Stratosphere's X-Scream roller coaster takes riders on a thrilling experience around the top of the resort's tower and then dangles them above the Las Vegas Strip before pulling them back. For the most extreme attraction seekers, the Stratosphere offers the ultimate experience called Sky Jump. This attraction offers guests an open-air leap off the Stratosphere Tower down to the Las Vegas Strip below. It holds the world record as the highest decelerator on the planet and it guides riders down to the ground safely at speeds of over 40 miles per hour. And what does the future have in hold for Las Vegas? One thing's for certain, the history will still be written in pencil, and what we see today may be gone tomorrow and replaced with something bigger and better.